We know him as the painter of squares. And the squares, of course, are part of the great reputation of Joseph. And this exhibition brings together some of the most beautiful ones that have ever been shown and presented side by side. I want to get right to a point that I by no means had expected to discuss tonight. Joseph used to talk about thinking in situations, allowing the unexpected to happen. The exhibition that you have seen or are about to see um, ends with a painting called Glow, one of the most beautiful homages to the square that belongs to the Hirshhorn Museum in Washington. And it was used as the image on a US postage stamp for which the, uh, brought out by the Department of Education, for which the slogan was, learning never ends. Well, this evening, I had the experience of going through the exhibition with two of your greatest architects, Juan Navarro uh, Baldeveg and Rafael Moneo, neither of whom I had ever met before. It was magic to be looking at Joseph's work with these two men who were so respective, respectful, so receptive to what they were looking at was simply perfect evidence that learning never ends. Juan spoke to me about the way that there is really no illusion in art, that everything takes place at once, everything is right, and this is something that I hope you will feel when looking at the show and that Joseph felt with the squares, that learning simply never ends. Now, he was a very practical man. He told me that he painted the squares the way that he spread butter on bread, period. And he always started in the center and worked his way out because his father taught him that when you paint a door, you start in the center, you work your way out, that way you catch the drips of paint and you don't get your cuffs dirty. Very practical. He worked on solid white masonite panels which allowed color to sing as powerfully as it could. He called these paintings platters to serve color. And he made miraculous things happen. For example, look at the one on the right. He would say, it's midnight and noon at the same time. This is what you get in art, not the realities of everyday life, but the particular world of art. Now, in the exhibition, you'll see his great publication, Interaction of Color. I'm very aware this evening, because we're graced by the presence of the American ambassador, um, and very aware that he and his partner are working with the Art and Embassies program on having Joseph's work here in Madrid. Interaction of Color, was first shown by the woman who started the Art and Embassies program, an ambassador's wife, uh, Mrs. Llewellyn Thompson, Jane Thompson, who had it in Moscow and described an evening to me when she arranged for corn on the cob to be flown in from Illinois for Nina and Nikita Khrushchev, who had a hard time eating it, and then she showed interaction of color to everybody there because what Joseph demonstrated is universal, goes beyond all languages, all time periods, and all cultures. He demonstrated the different ways that we perceive color. So I would ask you to look at these two blocks of tan. They really don't look the same. They're identical. They are a continuation of the same color. Colors change according to their setting. The same color can be made to look different. Here, you have these two grids. The one on the left appears 
to me, far lighter than the one on the right. They are made of the identical color. It looks different because of its surroundings. Now look at these X's. This one certainly looks more yellow than that one. Now, see the bottom line? The continuation? They are the same color. His paintings give great evidence of this exciting way that colors change and perception destabilizes us in a very exciting and thrilling way. I'm asking you, I'm counting on you, to do something here, which is please just focus on the black dot in the middle of this study of interaction of color on your left. Just focus on it. Look at nothing else. Just look at that black dot. Please continue looking until I ask you to do otherwise. You're looking, you're looking, and only when I say three, I'm going to ask you to turn to your right and look at the other screen. One, two, three. <laughs> now, I assume that most of you saw the impression of yellow triangles. Prior, or diamond shapes. Prior to this evening, I would have called it an illusion. Um, but thanks to the wisdom of uh, Mr. Baldwig, I'm not calling it an illusion. I'm recognizing that all of this is part of the experience of the retina and the human mind. So Joseph took these principles and applied them to the art of painting. Very simple language. He was so diligent. He didn't care about trends. He didn't care what was in, what was out, what was fashionable, what was expensive, what wasn't pop art, op art, abstract expressionism. It didn't interest him. What interested in him was the purity of those squares and the wonder of color and the variations that he could get of color. Diligently, day after day, living simply, modestly, he painted squares constantly pushing them in new directions. Please just look. I'm going never to show you the same painting twice. I just want you to enjoy his yellows and grays. I want you to pick your favorites. I want you to see the way that the motion changes when the colors change, even though you're always looking at what is factually the same painting. You certainly should have some that you prefer to others some that work for you, some that don't. Joseph would sometimes vary a painting only by changing a Windsor Newton Mars yellow from a Grumbacher Mars yellow in the center of a painting. And with that subtle change, everything else seems to change. Diligence, variations, creating a poetry from this very, very simple form of experimentation. Now, we live in a world where we're always rushing, always doing new things, looking for the latest kick, checking our cell phones. There's very little time just to observe. This morning, I was taking guides through this show, and I said, would they please make sure that people who come to this exhibition stop? Don't look for facts. Just look and observe. I'm going to ask you to look at these two homages to the square. If you were to describe them in words, you would be describing almost the same painting. You know, four squares going from oranges to a gray. The proportions are such that underneath the middle square, you have single units, double units to the left and right of it, triple units above it. Those are the facts. But look carefully, look at the differences, and then I'm going to ask you to look at the one on the left only, and you're going to hear about a minute of Beethoven's 14th string quartet performed by the Quartetto Italiano. Then you're going to look at the one on the right and listen to that same minute of music, but performed in an old recording by the Budapest. It's demanding. Look carefully, listen carefully. The same work of music, different performances. 
In many ways, the same painting, but different performances, different results, different emotions. And then there's the sheer pleasure. You're looking at four colors separately, but together. You're listening to four instruments separately, but together. You're looking at Albers and listening to Beethoven. You see, wine connoisseurs will ask you to notice the difference between the 2003 vintage and the 2004. Or what happens if you decant a wine or leave it open for two hours? Joseph wanted you to look at color that attentively and listen to music that attentively. He looked at all form with an idea of getting the maximum effect from minimal means. In your exhibition, you'll see his wonderful chair from the Bauhaus, which disassembled so that it could be shipped, a few elements perfectly put together. You'll see color studies, which show him 
constantly experimenting with materials. You'll see rare paintings like the one on the right called Cadence, which to my eye is an abstract form of something one sees in Piero della Francesca. In the Piero della Francesca Annunciation, you have the active form of the angel arriving and the more passive form of the virgin. Look at Joseph's abstraction. You have an active form and a passive form. You never have paint on top of a paint. The translucency and transparency are illusory in that painting on the right. You have abstract qualities which have the restraint and the power and the grace of Piero. In 1947, he began to paint a group of paintings that he called the variants or the adobes. You have beauties in this exhibition because the people here at your wonderful museum have gone out of their way to collect masterpieces from all over the world. I'm asking you for a moment to look very closely at the one on your left and imagine a conversation I had with Joseph. He was 85, I was 25. The year was um, 1973 or four. And he said to me, Nick, which color do you see the most of in this painting? Do you see the most of the red, the blue, the purple, or the brown? Now, he would say words are inadequate for describing colors, but remember, no color is painted on top of another. Each is paint straight from the tube. I'm asking you to look, and if you would, just call out your answer. In Spanish or English, what color is there the most of? Red. Red. Joseph would say, you will certainly, in a crowd of people, have four different answers, because we do not see colors in the same way. And then he said to me, there's an equal amount of each color. And Joseph explained to me, that's my madness. That's my craziness. But he loves systems. He loved order, because order and discipline enabled him to create poetry. He liked the way that the blue doesn't look the same here as it looks here. If you think you see more red, it's the quality of red. And that's what he wanted you to grasp. Not the quality of Albers, not the person of Albers, but the quality of red, universal truths. He wanted you to savor the movement. He wanted you to contemplate color quantity and light intensity. And then finally, he came to this beautiful language, 62 years old, simple, straightforward, monosyllabic language. Think of King Lear at the end of his life. All the pomp and ceremony are gone. He's reduced to the most refined language. It is Cordelia. Simple facts, three squares. And with three squares, you can go so far. He saw blues and greens as beautiful in themselves, also as representing the land, the earth, and the cosmos. He loved the sunniness of yellows. He experimented and experimented. And now, listen to the song, The Sunny Side of the Street, and feel the spirit of this one. I walk with no one and talk with no one. And I had nothing but shadows. Then one morning you passed. Then I brightened at last. Now I greet the day and complete the day with the sun in my heart. All my worries blew away when you taught me how to say. Your coat and get your hat. Leave your worries on the doorstep and just direct your feet on the sunny side of the street. And you hear that bitter path, that little happy tune is your step. 
life can be so sweet On the sunny side of the street Why should you walk in the shade With those blues on the rain Don't be afraid Be a rover and walk over And if you haven't got a fan You'll be as rich as Rockefeller With gold dust at your feet On the sunny side of the street Grab your coat Get that old derby hat Leave all your worries laying Right on your doorstep Left, right, left, direct your feet On the sunny side of the street Listen, can't you hear that little bitter pass? Oh, that happy tune, that should be your step. Cause life can be oh so sweet on the sunny side of the street. Why should you walk in the shade with old blues on parade? Come on, folks, don't be afraid. A little rover and walk over. And if you haven't got a cent, what of it? My laugh, you're as rich as Rockefeller with gold dust at your feet on the sunny side of the street. You know, Annie and Joseph Alberts were like the rest of us. They dealt with crises. In their cases, they dealt with war. They dealt with Nazism. They dealt with illness. But art was what put them on the sunny side of the street. They believed that it was the place where we can find serenity, balance, clarity, and joy even in the year that they fled to America, 1933, they created art that was technically rich, full of balance, the wonder of straight lines. And I was lucky enough to know Joseph toward the very end of his life. He was still robust and healthy in January of 1976 when I arrived at his house one day and I asked him, as always, how are you, Mr. Albers? And he said, schlecht. I'm having a difficult time today. I'm trying to do a painting, Nick, with a large central square. But to make it work, I need a particular paint, Windsor Newton Cobalt Green, number 196. And if I try it with the new Cobalt Green, number 205, downstairs is heaven, but upstairs is hell. He wasn't getting the interaction of color. And he said that the photographer Cartier-Bresson had told him that he painted circular squares, which meant that the corners disappear. And Joseph said to me that he was seeing the blue as the cosmos, the next color as the sea, and the, as the earth, sorry, and the next as the sea. And he was desperate for the right paint. That's what I mean by the attention to detail, the connoisseurship. I called every art supply store in Connecticut. We could not get that Winter Newton Cobalt Green. I then called the head of the American branch, it's an English company, I called the head of the American branch. He said there was no difference in their batches of Cobalt Green. And I said, I'm calling for Joseph Albers, sir. A few days later, five tubes of paint arrived in a box. Joseph painted this and he said, he had to paint the central square large because it was the cosmos, and he felt the cosmos was getting nearer. It was the last painting that he did, and as he said to me, the, poetry, the cosmos should have no boundaries, no edges, and no corners. He achieved that majesty in his work. There's a wonderful concert which will follow, including a performance of a piece that John Cage wrote for Joseph and Annie. He was a 
student at Black Mountain College, and I ask you, when you can, get to the exhibition and enjoy that incredible treat that Joseph Albers wanted us all to have every, days, every day of our lives, the pleasure of seeing and the wonder of open eyes. Thanks. Thank you.